Well, good morning and welcome uh, to Southside. Um, I miss Joe and Lydia. They, they had their, their wedding, and I, I was off a Sunday, and I didn't get to bring them up and pray for them. But uh, Joe and Lydia got married a week ago, so when they get back from their honeymoon, we'll bring them up here and introduce them so everybody knows who they are, and just be praying over that new marriage and everything we can do to help them uh, in their journey together. Um, one of our dear saints, uh, Sherry Hoover, she's been at Southside for many, many years, and she is going into hospice, and so she is entering her, her final leg to go see Jesus face to face. She has a beautiful faith. She's been trusting God through a lot of suffering, and so our joy is that she is about to get her reward. So let's be praying for her in a very special way. Sherry, if you feel well enough and you're listening this morning, you have the, the love of every one of us, and we care about you and what you're going through, and we're all going to be praying to help you. Amen, Timmy. <laughs> you have been a sweet blessing to us. Well, we're studying through the book of Romans as a church, and I'm just so blessed by the passage that we're going to look at this morning. It's so rich, and I want to be a minister for your joy. Uh, I pray that your joy would be made full today by what we're going to look at. There's a banner that hangs over your head that says no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so today we are opening up a new chapter. We're going to begin Romans chapter 8, if you'll turn to it. Uh, many have called this the greatest chapter in the Bible, not just in Romans. And so I'm still holding to Romans 3. I, I think the cross is just hard to trump but I reserve the right to change my opinion during this chapter. So I do see the glorious and beautiful truths that this chapter speaks of, and we're going to have an all-you-can-eat buffet for the next nine months, maybe. We're just going to plug in. We've been working hard together for a year and a half. We've been laboring in Romans, seeking to try to follow Paul's logic and his connections and his thoughts and applications of the gospel to the Christian life. Well, this morning we're going to stop and we're just going to make application of all that we've seen, all that we've journeyed, to take a look from the, the mountain of the doctrine that we've climbed and just kind of take it all in. I'm just going to ask you this morning to enjoy the scenery. God's blessed me with some amazing views in my life journey. I think my highlight was the sitting in Ireland and I looked at the Cliffs of Moher and just my heart was so overwhelmed with the beauty and the glory and the majesty and, and that pales in comparison to what I've seen from this mountain in Romans. And so what I want to do is bring you into my view this morning. I truly believe that these moments are good and necessary. Sometimes when you go on a trip and you're so focused on your schedule, your flights, trains, planes, automobiles, Ubers, uh, that you never, uh, you can forget to just enjoy it all. I've seen people, you take so many pictures, you, you miss the moment. And so just to stop and take it all in. That's what we're going to do this morning. James exhorts us to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Paul said, I'm writing to bring about the obedience of faith, to believe what Paul is writing, and, and to live accordingly to these truths. And that's what we're going to go after this morning. What, what is all of this doing for you? Is it making you smarter? Are you making some connections? Or are you believing? Are you believing this gospel that we're studying and that you are no longer under condemnation and all the fruits that flow from such a glorious truth and reality? Has this gospel brought you out from under condemnation as we just heard in these testimonies? Are there any remnants to your old life in Adam that need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you still are under condemnation in certain ways that you think and act? And so we're going to just dig in this morning, and my prayer is that every believer walks out of here with just no condemnation, that the reality has happened, and that you would understand it fully in your mind, thoughts, and conscience. And if you've walked in here and you're under condemnation, I pray that you could know that glorious banner over your head when you walk out of here this morning. We just heard a testimony of someone who sat in church for many, many years that was still under condemnation, and my prayer is that no one in this place would have that. So let's pray and ask God to do what only he can do through the word. Father, I pray I want no one in this room under condemnation. God, I ask by your spirit that you would move this morning in a mighty way. You would enlighten and show and reveal truth. I pray for the believers in this room, God, 
So many of us are prone to live under condemnation in our thoughts and our consciences and day to day. Lord, I'm praying for blessed freedom. We're celebrating those who gave their lives to bring freedom. And now I want to celebrate the one who gave his life to give us this freedom, the freedom of no condemnation before our God. Lord, meet us here today on this holy ground, I pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, here's where I want to start this morning is I just want to kind of set the context to Romans 8. I want to kind of give you the purpose and the movement of the chapter before we start digging in. So we're gonna, we'll take this uh, verse apart one word at a time this morning. Uh, I can't think of a verse more pregnant with meaning. Maybe back to Romans 3.24, I'll read it again. Just every word had so much to it. Being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in <coughs> Christ Jesus. And now this morning we're going to look at 8.1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so the, we're, we'll take a look and just see how full this verse is this morning. And, and we're going to fly over the chapter, I'm going to look at the forest, and then we'll start looking at the trees. So chapter 8, just one observation right out of the gate that I think anyone could make is that the, the focus now is the Holy Spirit. In 17 verses, the Holy Spirit's going to be mentioned 15 times. I think it's once or twice since the letter started. So we are now coming and moving in, and Paul's going to start opening up the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to grow us and sanctify us, to make us more like Christ. So this is big. We need to understand why and what Paul is then doing in this chapter. We're in the current section of Romans chapter 6 through 8. We're looking at how the gospel of justification that we studied for five chapters, that you're made right with God. He, he declares you acceptable before him by faith in Christ alone. What he has done is worked out in the believer's life. Okay, Paul says, can, the, the, the argument is, can we just sin that grace might abound? Can we just sin then if we're no longer under law, but under grace? And these great truths have come out of those questions like, Union with Christ, being joined to Him, the dominion of sin being broken in the believer's life, coming out from law so you could be married to another, and a marriage of pure grace to Jesus Christ that will bear fruit for God, and that you cannot bear fruit for God while you're under the law. You got to come out from under it. The powerful statement, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? You're not under law, but you're under grace. There's a mightier way to be changed and transformed than law could have ever done. So get this, we are told that we've been joined to Christ and we died with him. We were buried and we were raised, what? To walk in newness of life, to have a whole new transformation life. And therefore, don't let sin have, have rule and, and dominion. Don't give your members any longer to sin. Romans 6, 19, he says, you're freed from the slavery that you were under in sin. Romans 7, 4, you've died to the law that you could be joined to Christ. Uh, Romans 7, 6, you died to that which you were bound so that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. <clears throat> so how does all this work? How do we fight the fight of faith as Christians? How do, how do we grow and obey God more and become more holy? And what we have done is we've been seeing the theology of it. We've been understanding the way God has designed it. How, but the, the question this morning is, how do I get the boots on the ground? How do, we, how do we fight remaining sin that we've studied the last two weeks? How do we put it to death? To that, Romans 8 is going to lead us. And the answer, in short, is the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit takes of Jesus and reveals that to us in such a way as to empower us that we might be transformed into the image of Christ. And we saw this the last two weeks, how a powerful, defeated monarch called sin has been dethroned, and yet it, there's, still, there's still power, not ruling power, but remaining power that's in every believer's life. That we have an enemy within, not just without. It's not just a bad world. I got, a, I got bad still remaining. So the power to put it to death, it's not in my natural makeup. I can't put sin to death with Ken Murphy. 
I need a supernatural makeup, like a Holy Spirit of God dwelling within me, and that spirit will put to death this remaining sin within us. We are partakers of his divine nature. This is good. But you have to have this theological grid that we've been working on for some time now. And we have to work this out now day by day. And this is the application of the doctrine then that we have learned so far. And so what hangs over this whole chapter is that now we have a relationship to God. In Romans 5.1, we have peace with God. And in Romans 6, 1 through 4, we have a spiritual union with Christ by faith, and we've died. And in the atonement means at one minute. That atonement brings us into a relationship with God. And so our experience and relationship with God is through the Holy Spirit, who now dwells within us, mediating the presence of Jesus Christ to us. And what does that do to us? Well, what it does to us in Romans 8, 1, is I stand now saying there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's what we just heard testified. It's not just things I know in my head. This gospel has broken in, and I stand here with no condemnation over my head any longer. And it leads me to the end of the chapter that nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I love that one part. He says, nothing created will ever be able to separate me from God, which is everything except him. And so this, this spirit reveals this gospel, and now I live in to the fullness of these truths. That's where we're going to journey. And so you know what these statements are, is that you're no longer under law, but you're under grace. And now he's gonna, the spirit will reveal that and show us that, and we can't keep living under law and living under its condemnation. And so the spirit-filled believer is, I'm living under no condemnation, and that's going to bear fruit for God. The Holy Spirit is teaching us, and he's convincing us. And you, this, this is the way to know if you're growing in Christ, that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I live in a world that can separate me from love on a daily basis. I live in a relationship with God that nothing can separate me from his love. And I need the truth of God's word and his spirit convincing me of this on a daily basis, because I see things that make me think can separate me from the love of God. I need to get Romans 8.1 past my noggin and into my heart if I'm ever going to bear fruit for God. So who really believes 24-7 that there's no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus? I need the spirit to lead me into this truth deeper and deeper and daily. And let the freedom that comes to a heart that lives under this produce the fruit that comes from the marriage to Christ and to bring this into reality. I've counseled probably for way too long, but I've seen wives who have to live in the fear of a controlling, mean husband. And then he unleashes and he rejects you. And he's always disappointed. And you know what that does? It never bears good fruit. That's not a marriage. That's what our marriage to the law was. You cannot live the Christian life the way that God calls you to by going in and out of condemnation. You just, you can't do an end around this doctrine. This is reality and this is our foundation. We have to live under grace. It's a reality, it's true about us. We have to renew our minds into the fullness and the beauty of what God has done for us in Christ. I need the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit to keep revealing that to me through the word. Show me the fullness of Christ as Paul prayed in my inner being. I need to get this. I need to see it, understand it. You can't live the Christian life the way God calls you if you don't understand you're not in condemnation. So catch this. The way that Paul gets you to Romans 8, 38 through 39, let me just read that because we're going to talk about it all morning. <clears throat> For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's one of the most richest things. That's what Romans 8, 1 is telling us as well. And so it's now to come this morning and take the truth and the doctrine and build a case one word at a time until it finally climaxes at the end of the chapter where there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So just our flyover, Romans 8, 1 through 4. 
<clears throat> there's no condemnation. Nothing can separate us from this love because the Spirit unites us with what Christ has done for us. He condemns sin in the flesh. That's our hope. Verses 5 through 11, the Spirit is sanctifying us. He's changing us. And we're going we're gonna to grow in assurance and confidence because we're watching God work in us what our own strength never could do. Romans 8, 12 through 13, the Spirit is going to mortify the deeds of the body. That remaining sin that we've been studying, we're going to put it to death by the Spirit. Romans 8, 14 through 17, the Spirit is going to directly assure us that we're children of God and that we're joint heirs. The best assurance you can have when the Holy Spirit testifies with your spirit, I'm a child of God. And Romans 8, 18 through 25, the Spirit is going to bring us to future glory through suffering and one day the redemption of this body that we will battle sin no more. Romans 8, 26 through 27, the Spirit intercedes for us. I don't know how to pray all the time. He prays perfectly and He's going to keep us and He's going to intercede for us. Romans 8, 28 through 30, the Spirit is working out God's purpose to conform us to the likeness of Jesus Christ. And then Romans 8, 31 through 39, we're going to end with these beautiful questions that nothing can condemn you. Jesus was already condemned in your place on a cross. So if God is this, and he did this, and he's going to do this, this is the gospel of Romans, then the Spirit can lead you to no condemnation, and nothing can separate you from his love. The Spirit uses truth to get you to this sweet place. It's the best place that a human could live the refuge that all of us seek. Has all of your great learning brought you to this sweet place? This is the place for me to be a minister for your joy. And this is where I want you. And I labor day and night that you would live in this sweet place. And I'm praying for that for every heart this morning. So I want you to hear this, my dear brethren. The Holy Spirit is in the business of assuring you that, you could, that he cannot lose you and you cannot lose him that there's no condemnation and nothing can separate you from his love. Whatever you're facing this morning, I'm praying the Spirit convinces you that even what's going on right now can't separate you from his love. So Southside, we get to walk this journey together in the months ahead, and I hope not years, but months. May God bear much fruit in our lives during this time. And will you commit to pray for this? I pray that you pray it for yourself and for this body. That, that every one of us live under this and get it, and the fruit that will come will be beautiful. So let's ask God to do what no human being can do. Oh, Father, I pray by your Spirit. Shine, illuminate these words. Open minds and hearts. Lord, I'm praying for freedom for those who have had to labor under self-condemnation on a daily basis. Let the gospel break in. God, let it set them free in the parts they're not believing, parts of unbelief that are so easily entangling them and encumbering them this morning. And so, Lord, use the word of God to set your children free uh, from self-imposed condemnation that is not there before your heart this morning. And so, God, let us enter into this. Do a mighty work in our midst, I pray. Amen. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. First word, therefore, and I know you know I love this word, but I, I love it a little more this morning, I think. Some of the therefores are more significant than others. I'm going to go out on a limb. My favorite one is Romans 12, 1. We're going to climb higher in Romans, and he's going to say, therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. Uh, but this one is right up there because I, I, I see both connecting the same idea, the, the gospel with life. Romans 12 is just connecting a little more outworking that we will do. But, but the question this morning is, what is it there for? Well, many of the commentators and preachers that I like see it picking up the whole argument of Romans, and I think that's right. It's, it started in chapter 1, and we've been looking at the whole gospel, and, and there, there's definitely, I think, an emphasis also on chapter 7, but let's make sure that the therefore gets the full weight of what Paul intended in our minds and hearts. And that's why I say we sit on top of this mountain, taking it in, everything that Paul's been teaching us, and I just want to survey it again. Romans 1.16 
I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to bring us into salvation. And the question is, salvation from what? Well, salvation from the wrath of God, Romans 1.18, it's revealed against all ungodliness from heaven. We need to be delivered from the wrath that God has upon a fallen race that has inherited sin from Adam and in our own hearts. And he spends three chapters to make sure that every person who has ever been born of Adam knows that you are separated from God and under this wrath. Jesus said the wrath of God is abiding upon you. And what we've done is we've been made for him and we traded him, Paul said, for a lesser glory. Instead of the glorious God being everything to us, we make all these little trivial lesser things like us and everything around us. Instead of worshiping God, we've traded him. All have sinned, whether you're Jew or Gentile, a murderer or a Bible-smiling, preaching person. Paul shows really well that nothing can get you out from under this wrath. You can't do it in your free will, your understanding, your goodness back in Romans 3. You just can't get out from under it looking to your own stuff, your own merit, your own power. And so the symphony that Paul is playing here in chapter 8 is you'll never get the fullness of it or the beauty of it until you know that you are under condemnation. You've been born into it. And it's a condemnation that's hideous and awful. And I want you to hear this word, it's everlasting. It does not end. It's a condemnation that you can do nothing to get off of you. Except the beautiful words in Romans 3.21, but now. Those words change the whole symphony from a dark dirge to Handel's Messiah, where we're all just yelling, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah chorus. There's propitiation that Jesus went on a cross, and he took all that condemnation, and he bore it, all of God's wrath. And God imputes to us that work and his righteousness. He will put it to our account, and now he will treat us as if we lived the life he lived and died the death that he died. And that alone can bring us to the place this morning I want you to hear. There is right now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The blessed therefore that we are looking at. And I think there's even more to this word therefore. In the last two weeks, we've seen a battle with remaining sin, with indwelling sin. And that will be with us until we breathe our last. And Paul says, who will set me free from the body of this death? the one who desires to do good. And I see in my members flesh doing sin. And as I pondered that, I just see it more and more. God calls me to love my wife like Christ loved the church. And I just miss it on a daily basis. To not exasperate your children. To worship with a pure heart. To love without hypocrisy. To deny self. To consider others as better than yourself, to go the extra mile, to not get angry, to not lust, to not think that something else will make me happy, to not worry when I watch the news, to trust God when I feel a lump in the back of my neck, to trust God with my children and their decisions, to not be afraid to share with the person in front of me, to follow God and serve him on the mission field if he calls me to just really trust them with my future. And I look at these things and I got remaining sin that is just fighting me. I'm going to give one more quote by Packer and we'll move on. He said, Alive in Christ, this believer's heart delights in the law and he wants to do what is good and right and thus keep it perfectly. But he finds that he cannot achieve total compliance at which he aims. Whenever he measures what he has done, he finds that he has fallen short. From this, he perceives that the anti-God urge called sin, though dethroned in his heart, still dwells in his own body. Thus, the Christian's moral experience is that his reach persistently exceeds his grasp. He, He wants to be more holy than he can be. And that his desire for perfection is frustrated by the discomposing and distracting energies of indwelling sin. Paul here proclaims that this present involuntary imperfection, summed up in the latter part of verse 25, will one day be made a thing of the past through the redemption of the body in Romans 8.23. 
For that future redemption, we must long and wait, maintaining always the two-world, homeward traveling, hoping for glory perspective that pervades the whole New Testament. All I want to do is live for God and trust Him, and yet I find flesh with opposing desires. And you know what this does to me is it makes me feel like a wretched man. Who will deliver me from this? I know so much about the cross and Jesus, all of his beauty and what he has done, yet I still sin against such amazing grace. Who will deliver me? I'm too bad even for Jesus. (laughs) I can't battle sin like this and have any hope of not being condemned. And so for you, I want you to lift your head this morning, sinner saint. One whom indwelling sin is a reality and not just a doctrine. One who has felt your condemnation. Who will set me free from this Jesus Christ. So then there's a battle. And the first thing I want you to hear in this battle with remaining sin and all of your driftings and desires to please him and coming short way too often. That therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, is so, this is so big to my Christian life that we are still sinners. In our chapter, we still die, just like unbelievers, sometimes in deep and profound pain and suffering. <clears throat> we still sit in rooms with chemo dripping in our veins. We still enter into hospice. We're still put to death all day long. And I want you to get this because our enemy will come running at you when you get in really deep depression. And you're groaning because we still sin and still suffer and still don't know how to pray because it's so hard and we still die and we still have loved ones that die. Therefore, right now, brother and sister, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're not separated from his love, even though it might feel like it this morning. So this chapter is calling you to to not live by what it feels like or what it seems or even what it appears, but to live by truth, the truth that comes from the mouth of God. You are not under condemnation. You are not separated from his love. And his spirit is seeking to lead you into that this very hour through truth. So do you like this, therefore? Tombstone. All right. Therefore, second point I want to look at is there's no condemnation. And that's what we've seen in this letter. Three chapters to make sure you get that you're under condemnation, whether you're moral or immoral. Paul wanted you to feel that really, really deep. Didn't it get kind of old? It's COVID. I'm up here by myself. You guys were locked away at home and I'm pounding away at the Romans 1, 2, and 3 that you're dead. You're under condemnation. You're dying. It's hard to do that as a pastor, but I couldn't see your faces. So all I could think of is at home, they're throwing things at the TV there, but there was a reason. He wanted you to not just say, oh, I got sin. He wanted you to say, I'm sinful. To the core of my being, the stream will always be dirty because the fountain's dirty. I'm broken. I'm under condemnation. Paul wants you to feel that. Why? So that this morning you could really, really, really feel there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He wants you to feel that more deeply than Romans 1 through 3. That all of that wasn't to make you miserable for fun. It was to bless you. So that you could sit here this morning after feeling all of that condemnation. There's none. Not even a drop for the child of God. Where's my butt? Hey, you should be yelling something out at me. Yes. I was worried you were asleep, so I'm going to keep an eye on you. This should be shouted from the rooftops. And I'm not ashamed of this gospel... Because it's the power of God for salvation from what? From the wrath of God that's going to condemn you. I love this gospel. It's the only thing that can get you out from under that. The wrath that you could not get out under no matter what you did. 
The Son of God went under it. He bore it on a cross for three hours so that now you stand forgiven at the cross. To the picture of a man sitting in his cell waiting for the electric chair. He's guilty. There's no way out. And all of a sudden, the dungeon flames with light. And the warden's son went and sat in your chair and paid you a penalty and says, you can go free. Can you imagine that feeling? How much more God's sentence, you shall surely die. You're condemned. And you look at Calvary's cross with his son hanging on it, taking your condemnation, and now the banner over you is there's no condemnation. The word condemnation does not place its focus on the verdict, but the penalty. You're not guilty, and there's no condemnation. And the, the Greek word here, no. Paul, Paul does not choose. There's a simple negative in the Greek called u. But the compound that's even stronger is ude. And he puts it at the beginning of the sentence to, to intensify the negative even more. So what I'm trying to get at, you can't say it any stronger in the Greek. There is no, none, not a drop of condemnation. We sang it, no condemnation, now I dread. Gone. It was all poured out on your substitute. He, I, I told you on Good Friday, he drained the cup. There's not a drop left in that cup. It's gone. I will forgive your iniquities and I will remember your sins no more. The thief on the cross, what did he feel? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Philippian jailer with the sword drawn and he, he's saved. The Pharisee and the publican, I, I'm smiting myself. Today he went home justified. The harlot washing Jesus' feet. Your sins are forgiven. Sin does not condemn you. The law can no longer condemn you. The devil cannot condemn you. Hell cannot condemn you. God does not condemn you this morning. <laughs> There's no more, none condemnation. Oh, that the Spirit would let that sink in. We're finished with the realm of condemnation. Have you finished with it in your mind? I live to a reconciled, appeased God. And, and I'll tell you what I see constantly is as Christians, we, we ask for forgiveness and then we're forgiven. And then we sin again and we come under condemnation. And now I confess it and I'm forgiven again. And then I do it again and I come back under condemnation. That's how we live our lives. The Christian can never be condemned again. It's a positional truth. It's your standing. It's your status. No, never. If a Christian, your past, present, and future sins were dealt with at the cross of Jesus Christ, and my question is, won't people just sin then? Mega noito, perish the thought. There's nothing that will motivate you more to live holy than to get this one understood. Thirdly, for those who are in Christ Jesus, I love that word, those. It does not say only to those who have complete victory in their life. It does not say to the super saints, I'm not like Paul, I'm not an evangelist, I'm not a preacher, I'm not like a David who stood against Goliath, I, I don't suffer the way Job did, I whine, I cry. It's just for those who are in Christ Jesus. There are only two kinds of people in the world, in Christ with no condemnation and those who are not in Christ under God's condemnation. No other category. It's for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I think this is one of the greatest statements in this passage, this little preposition in. If in Christ, you will remain there and nothing can take you out from where you could ever come under condemnation again. You're secured in that preposition by the power of God. To be in Christ Jesus, hell itself can't pull you out of that little preposition. In Christ. Romans 5.10, you were saved in his life. Romans 5.12-21, through 21, you're in Adam and all that was imputed. And in Christ, all of this comes to you. He's our city of refuge. We're safe from the justice and wrath of God. He's our ark. He delivers us from the wrath to come. It's just You are in Christ. And one more just is, present tense verb, 
Now, not based on our future obedience, not on us earning merit or favor. Right now, nothing of the sinner is taken into account of his discharge from condemnation. Nothing to do with you. It's all what Christ did. And so those who are in Christ Jesus, we've been placed beyond the reach of condemnation. It can't get to you. You're in that ark. It cannot touch you. In Christ Jesus, how do I get there? I want in. Romans 1 through 7. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. I get in to Christ Jesus by repenting and believing in Jesus Christ and what he's done through his work on the cross and his fulfilling the law. By faith, I'm in Christ Jesus, and he dealt with what brings condemnation, my sin. And he dealt with it on the cross, and it's forgiven, so I can never be back under condemnation, ever. And we're going to close with one last, I like all these little words this morning, now. You thought I missed that, didn't you? Some of you are like, Pastor missed, I think, one of the most important words. Therefore, there is now... Now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful little word, now. There's going to be a last day judgment. And everyone's going to pair before the judgment seat of Christ. And the verdict that will be given to you on that day is going to be that of not guilty. You're declared not guilty. <clears throat> and so we don't have to spend all of our days worrying about what will be the verdict on the last day. You imagine just uh, uh, you've done something and there's a long trial and you're waiting sentence from the judge. What are they going to do? Paul was sitting in a prison. Are they going to cut my head off or not when he wrote Philippians? You're just waiting for that. What, what's going to happen when, when my verdict is read? But for us right now, this morning, we have the verdict of the end day judgment. Not guilty. No condemnation on that day. The reality is that I'm not waiting to see if God will be favorable to me on the last day. Working hard. I want to make sure that he's favorable. I want to be nice to people with their groceries and old ladies and help them and mow grass. I just want that day to go well. So I'm working. That's not going to do it. That's not going to do it right now. Some of you sit in this anxiety daily. And I just want you to hear one little word. Now, this day justified believer, there is no, not any, not ever condemnation. You've come out from its jurisdiction and you can never come under this pronouncement again. No condemnation. Tell me that won't change your life. We stand in grace. And my prayer for all of you this morning is that you would get this this now. Make it your screensaver. <laughs> so every day, you just look, now. There's no condemnation. I lived in this religion where you never knew. Just every day, you hope your good deeds outweigh the bad. Can you imagine the guilt and what a mess I was? <laughs> and you can sit here this morning right now. No condemnation. Because of what Christ did. That's, that's glorious. And that's why we gather that's good news. Okay, so I got 12 points of application. And I'm gonna, I promise you, I'm going to move quickly. First, this is the message of Christianity. <laughs> not social justice. Not political. Are you woke? This is the message of Christianity. And the shame of the church is that we're making something else the message. And this is why Paul gave his life. And this is why he was imprisoned and beaten. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I have that message and I'm going to herald it. I'm going to proclaim it. And I'm going to tell all this message. And the fruits that come out of justified believers will be beautiful and we will love God and love other people. But this is the message of Christianity. Second, maybe you had a religious upbringing and all you were ever taught was motivation by condemnation. To get you to do what you were supposed to do by the fear of hell. And that's a far cry for the next therefore. Therefore, I urge you to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice by what? By the mercies of God. <laughs> the whole motivation is going to be the mercies of God. Not this. 
Your whole life was just, how do you keep condemnation off of you? And I want you this morning to be set free from a lifetime of thinking that way and wrestling. No condemnation is what will actually change your life. That other message doesn't work. Number three, I'm thinking of those who are suffering deeply, physical pain and illness. We have a lot of it in our church. And it's really hard. And then Job's comforters come and they kind of remind you you're under God's condemnation. An enemy comes and he tells you the exact same thing. And for you this morning, I want you to hear right now, you're not under condemnation. But you're under Romans 8.28 that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do not interpret that as condemnation. It's the love of God to conform his children to his image. It's not condemnation. Number four, what if it ends in death? I remember just watching my dad. It, you, you keep waiting for something to happen and cure. And it just gets worse and worse until they say hospice. And what, what do you do then? Is this condemnation? It's emancipation. As you sit waiting to die, it's not condemnation. My dad was just a new believer, trusting this simple message. And he smiled and didn't feel one second that it was condemnation. It was the hand of God bringing him to his home. And so I want you to see if this even leads you to your deathbed. I want you ready to fight. It's not condemnation. It's the love of God. Number five, a marriage. Maybe where you're living with a spouse condemning you, always showing you where you stink and where you're blowing it. <laughs> I want you this morning to let this break in. There's no condemnation. And when you get that, you can now love someone who's condemning you. You can begin to love other people uh, because you're not condemned in Christ Jesus. Number six, I know I don't get Romans 8.1 when I spend all of my days condemning other people. Here's a real simple way to find out, am I understanding this truth? Are you just kind of that negative Nancy that you're just always condemning anyone and everyone and all your fellowship is around condemning everyone and it just, that's all you are. You're just a big bucket of condemnation and you're pouring it on everybody. Uh, when you get this gospel, it can empower you to stop and to accept and receive and minister to them and hope and believe. This can set you free from that sin and that bondage. Number seven, do you live under the power of someone else's condemnation? As a pastor, I'm just seeing this more and more where you might have had a parent's condemnation and you live under it every day or a spouse, a friend, and your whole life is driven by that. And you're always living under that condemnation. Please hear this morning from God himself, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, so that you can heal and forgive the person who gave you that condemning message. There's a way to come out from under that banner of you're condemned. And I want you to hear God in Christ Jesus say, no condemnation. It's freedom. Parenting, maybe your house is a home of condemnation. Your, your door knocker should just say, home of Mount Sinai, and you knock it and smoke comes out. rather than no condemnation. It doesn't mean you don't correct, teach, but it needs to be a place where they know nothing can separate them from the love of mom and dad or mom or dad, whoever's there. That's what I want my home to smell like Mount Zion. Nine, maybe you have a wayward kid. Maybe you had one take their life. And all you hear is condemnation every day. I failed as a parent. I can't even function because I just live under that condemnation. And this morning, there's freedom in this message. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hurting parent, let that just go right in. Number 10, you're still under the law, and therefore you always live under God's condemnation because you come short every day and you just feel it. And the Christian life to you is just walking in condemnation and you don't even evangelize because you don't want to say, come be miserable like me. You're just under condemnation and you're living under it. And this gospel is to come out from law 
And now to live under grace with a God who approves you and likes you and delights over you and declares you not guilty. I want you to let that set you free and to live in that every day. Beautiful. I think I'm on 11. I think my numbers got messed up. Can you say as you sit here this morning with remaining sin, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? And there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Or do you live on a daily basis saying, there's no way God could accept me. I still battle too much. And you just live under that. There's no power in that. And 12, the whole church this morning is on holy ground. And so I'm going to ask you this. Do you believe this? Are you applying it to every area of your life? This is what is giving sin its power is condemnation. This is a cry to all of us this morning to believe that right now in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation, not even a drop. And I'm telling you that will change the life of this body. It will change your life. And so unbeliever, I I say this with judgment day honesty, you are under condemnation. And coming to Southside isn't going to remove it. Trying to be a better person isn't going to fix that. And and understand it's God's condemnation. You're under God's condemnation. You want to hear this? You feel guilty because you are. And this message is there's a way for God to say not guilty. And there's a way for him to say no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I want you this morning to come to Christ and believe in him and what he's done on that cross by dying for your sins and living the life that God required of you. He lived it. And if you will believe in that this morning, you come out from under it. And now there's none. And you are loved and accepted by God. What a glorious message. I I pray that some burdens would fall off this morning off the children of God who still live under this condemnation. And I, I pray for those who are like that first baptism and you just sit in the church and you just have no heart for Jesus Christ, that's not what happens when you're born again. And so it may be because of condemnation, you're not understanding the gospel, but it could be you've never come to Christ. And so I I pray this morning that you would come to this Christ and be saved. I'll be up front afterwards and would love to talk with you. Uh, Other elders will be up here as well, and we want to minister to your soul. Let's pray. Father, my heart overflows with a good thing. The banner over us is no condemnation because of Christ Jesus. Thank you for making us in Christ, making us in union with him, joining us to Christ so that now from that fountain flows every blessing. Every blessing flows from Jesus Christ, not guilty, loved, accepted. Nothing can separate me from your love. We give God, we give you the praise, the glory through Christ Jesus. He's our hope. He's our savior. He's our king. And so I thank you for him. And I pray, Lord, for these saints that I love so dearly, any who are stuck under condemnation in their own mind and in their own conscience, that your word by your spirit this morning would set them free and they could enter into the joy of their master. Oh God, bless us this morning with this gorgeous message of Romans 8.1. And it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen.